Greetings, one and all, once again, to the Tolkien-centered podcast called Exploring Arda. Um, I am your host, Jackson, and yes, I've been away <laughs> for a long, long time. Just because uh, a lot of stuff kind of piled up all at once. Um, a little thing called life, you know, it's like, it's it's ridiculous of how, mon- how many things uh, it piles up all at once sometimes, so... I pretty much had to put this um, personal project on hold for a couple weeks. Um, I think I should be back recording and uploading for sure. I think either Sunday or Monday, depending on when I edit the other episode of the podcast that I do with my friend called Drink and Dried, which is a nerdy podcast dedicated to pretty much movie reviews, uh, some show TV show uh, reviews. We used to do a little bit of D&D. We're kind of taking a break from that as well, but we still have some future plans, so, I mean, just check out the show. We've we've got almost, uh, I don't even know, like 90 episodes in. We're almost to 100, so check it out. We've got a lot of content there, but we're not really there for, uh, we're not here. There you go. <laughs> we're not here for all of that. We're here for the Silmarillion and the continuing reading of me and ranting about uh, pretty much what happens in each of the chapters. Um, if you can't tell because of the um, title of the episode, I am doing two chapters because they're actually pretty short. They're only a few pages long, so I kind of figured might as well just do chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, and chapter 6 is of Feanor and the Unchaining of Melkor, and 7 is of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor. So I thought uh, those would do good together so uh with all the introductions all done and said and everything like that um i think we can jump into the story once again i'm actually really excited to finally be back back to recording this because i finally get further into the story because there's so much more to to go so also if i do sound a little different because i'm still trying to edit with different mics and different sound effects and maybe sound effects, maybe music. I don't know. I'm still kind of figuring it out and get all the stutters out of the way first before I start recording. So, all right, here we go. So, chapter six of Feanor and the Unchaining of Melkor. Now the three kindreds of the Eldar were gathered at last in Valinor and Melkor was chained. This was the noontide, noontide, I'm already messed up, oh boy. (laughs) This was the noontide of the blessed realm, the fullness of its glory and its bliss, long in tale of years, but in memory too brief. In those days, the Eldar became full grown in stature of body and of mind, and the Noldar advanced ever in skill and knowledge, and the long years were filled with their joyful labors, in which many new things fair and wonderful were devised. Then it was that the Noldor first bethought them of letters. Of Rumil of Tyrion was the name of the lore master who first achieved fitting signs for the recording of speech and song. Some for graving upon metal or in stone, others for drawing with brush or with pen. And that time was born in Eldamar, in the house of the king of Tyrion, upon the crown of Tuna, the eldest of the sons of Finwë and the most beloved. Cura Finwë was his name, but by his mother he was called Feanor, spirit of fire and thus he is remembered in all the tales of the Noldor. So I'll stop here for a little bit, uh, a little introduction of the chapter, pretty much. Uh, Valinor is still in its blissful, uh, pretty much paradise phase, as Melkor is still technically chained, and we get an introduction to Feanor, who is kind of important in this uh, story, uh, and we'll probably see why very soon. Um, But yeah, he goes by Kura Finwë first, Um, but pretty much, uh, he gets pretty much known as Feanor as soon as he, you know, makes a certain something. So, uh, back to the story here. Muriel was the name of his mother, who was called Serinde, because of her surpassing skill in weaving and needlework. For her hands were more skilled to fineness than any hand even among the Noldor. The love of Finwë and Muriel was great and glad, for it began in the Blessed Realm in the Days of Bliss. But in the bearing of her son, Muriel was consumed in spirit and body, and after his birth she yearned for release from the labor of living. And when she had named him, she said to Finway, 
Never again shall I bear child, for strength that would have nourished the life of many has gone forth into Vainor. Then Finway was grieved, for the Noldor were in the youth of their days, and he desired to bring forth many children into the bliss of Amun, and he said, Surely surely there is healing in Amun? Here all weariness can find rest. But when Muriel languished still, Finway sought the counsel of Manway, and Manway delivered her to the care of Irmo and Lorien. At their parting, for a little while as he thought, Finway was sad, for he seemed an unhappy chance that the mother should depart and miss the beginning at least of the childhood days of her son. It is indeed unhappy, said Muriel, and I would weep if I were not so weary, but hold, hold me blameless in this and in all that may come after. Uh, so pretty much, yeah. So Muriel and Finway are pretty much on opposite sides of, like, uh, <laughs> Finway's like, okay, I, I actually really wanted a lot more kids, and Muriel's like, no, look, as soon as this kid was born, um, I think I'm done, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, and pretty much they go back and forth. Like, he's kind of upset, but she's like, look, 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 look. You're not having the children here. I'm done, and we're calling it quits. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, back to it here. She went then to the gardens of Lorien and lay down to sleep. But though she seemed to sleep, her spirit indeed departed from her body and passed in silence to the halls of Mandos. The maidens of Este tended the body of Muriel, and it remained unwithered, but she did not return. Then Finway lived in sorrow, and he went often at the gardens of Lorien, and sitting near, sorry, sitting beneath the silver willows, beside the body of his wife, he called her by her names. But it was unavailing, and alone in all the blessed realm, he was deprived of joy. After a while, he went to Lorien no more. So another quick little side note, probably should have read this <laughs> after all that, is that um, pretty much Muriel is still pretty sad of everything. She's, I don't know, like, she, I feel like she might feel like a little disappointed in herself because of what Finway wanted. But, um, I mean, really it was kind of like her choice of like, hey, I don't want any more. And she got pressured and then she went to Lorien and then pretty much just straight up died. So that was, you know. It's an interesting little side note there that's not really talked a whole lot about, but I don't know. Just very interesting things that happen along the way. So, we'll go right back to the story here. And I'll fix the microphone situation here. Okay, there we go. Making sure it's all right. All right. Okay, we're good. <sighs> all his love he gave thereafter to his son, and Feanor grew swiftly, as if a secret fire were kindled within him. He was tall and, and fair of face and masterful, his eyes piercingly bright and his hair raven dark, and in the pursuit of all his purposes eager and steadfast. Few ever changed his courses by counsel, none by force. He became, of all the Noldor, then or after, the most, most subtle in mind and the most skilled in hand. In his youth, bettering the work of Rumil, he devised those letters which bear his name and which the Eldar used ever after. And he it was who, first of the Noldor, discovered how gems, greater and brighter than those of the earth, might be made with skill. The first gems that Feanor made were white and colorless, but being set under starlight, they would blaze with blue and silver fires brighter than Helluin. And other crystals he made also, wherein things far away could be seen small but clear, as with the eyes of the eagles of Manwe. Seldom were the hands and mind of Feanor at rest. So, I thought... Um, it's, it's very important uh, to get the gist of like what Feanor is all about because he's pretty much a really great crafter and all the elves are pretty much like in awe of all of his skill, which is comes, uh, it, it's very important. Pretty, I keep saying it's, it's important, but just wait. <laughs> it's kind of all what, what the whole book's about. So, all right, back to it here. While still in his early youth, he wedded Nerdano the daughter of a great smith named Matan. Matan. I'm going to say Matan. Yeah. <laughs> Among those of the Noldor most dear to Aule. And of Matan, he learned much of the making of things in metal and in stone. Nerdano also was firm of will, but more patient than Feanor, de desiring the, to understand minds rather to, than to master them. And at first she restrained him when the fire of his heart grew too hot, but his later deeds grieved her, and they became estranged. 
Seven sons she bore to Fainor, her mood she bequeathed in part to some of them, but not to all. Now it came to pass that Finway took a, as his second wife Indis the fair. She was a Vanya, close kin of Ingwe, the high king, golden-haired and tall, and in all ways unlike Muriel. Finway loved her greatly and was glad again, but the shadow of Muriel did not depart from the house of Finway, nor from his heart. And of all whom he loved, Fainor had ever the chief share of his thought. The wedding of his father was not pleasing to the Fainor, and he had no great love for Indus, nor for Fingolfin and Finarfin, her sons. He lived apart from them, exploring the lands of Amun, or busying himself within the knowledge and the crafts in which he delighted. In those unhappy things which later came to pass, and in which Fainor was the leader, many saw the effect of his breach within the house of Finway, judging that if Finway had endured his loss and been content with the fathering of his mighty son, the courses of Fainor would have been otherwise, and great evil might have been prevented. For the sorrow and the strife in the house of Finway is graven in the memory of the Noldoran elves. But the children of Indus were great and glorious, and their children also, and if they had not lived the history of the Eldar would have been diminished. So we're not quite uh, done with the chapter yet, but um, another quick summary is that um, it, it tells of like how Feanor marries, but uh, Nerdonal was like uh, kind of off and on, I guess, like between both of them and uh, their children were both like uh, well, they, they agreed on some of them and disagreed on others. Um, I think that's kind of, I don't know. I, I feel like it's very much like his father, Finway, kind of that whole thing, like back and forth. Uh, but even when Finway, um, what, what was it? Oh, yeah, took his wife, Indus. He was like, no, 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 Indus is great. But F Finway was like, no, 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 no. OG mom is the great. But Finway's like, no, 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 no. Indus is, Indus is better, pretty much. Even with everything, uh, Muriel is still in his thoughts, and obviously with uh, Feanor as well. So, and um, pretty much, they don't get along anymore. So, I, I kind of get the gist of that. So, back to it again. Now, even while Feanor and the craftsmen of the Noldor worked with delight, foreseeing no end to their labors, and while the sons of Indus grew to their full stature, the noontide of Valinor was drawing to its close. For it came to pass that Melkor, as the Valor had decreed, completed the term of his bondage, dwelling for three ages in the Duras of Mandos alone. At length, as Manwe had promised, he was brought again before the thrones of the Valar. Then he looked upon their glory and their bliss, and envy was in his heart. He looked upon the children of Ilavatar that sat at the feet of the mighty, and hatred filled him. He looked upon the wealth of bright gems, and he lusted for them, but he hid his thoughts and postponed his vengeance. Before the gates of Valmar, Melkor abased himself at the feet of Manwe and sued for pardon, vowing that if he might if he might be made only the least of the free people of Valinor, he would aid the Valar in all their works, and most of all in the healing of the many hurts that he had done to the world. And Nienna aided his prayer, but Mandos was silent. Then Manwe granted him pardon, but the Valar would not yet suffer him to depart beyond their sight and vigilance, and he was constrained to dwell within the gates of Valmar. But fair-seeming were all the words and deeds of Melkor in that time, and both the Valar and the Eldar had profit from his aid and counsel, if they sought it. And therefore in a while he was given leave to go freely about the land, and it seemed to Manwe that the evil Melkor was cured. For Manwe was free from evil and could not comprehend it, and he knew that in the beginning, in the thought of Ilavatar, Melkor had been even as he, and he sought, saw not to the depths of Melkor's heart, and did not perceive that all love had departed from him forever. But Ilmo was not, de was not deceived, and Tulkas clenched his hands whenever he saw Melkor, his foe, go by. For if Tulkas is slow to wrath, he is, also, he is slow also to forget. But they obeyed the judgment of Manwe, for those who will defend authority against rebellion must not themselves rebel. Um, yeah, so another quick update here again is that um, pretty much... As Feanor is pretty much off doing his own, you know, family uh, <laughs> disputes and whatnot, uh, Melkor actually ends up serving his time, and so Manwe's like, okay, well, we we pretty much promised this guy that uh, we he, we'll keep him chained up for three three ages, and it's been that time, and even though pretty much 
it's it's, it's kind of like you know tossed back and forth as well between the Valar, but obviously most of them are like, no, no, that's not a really good idea. But Manu's like, hey, listen, that's what we promised this guy. We're the Valar, pretty much. They're the good guys, quote unquote, good guys. And it's Melkor, so with his twisting, um, kind of charismatic words and whatnot, he gets to go free. So um, almost to the end here of six. Now, in his heart, Melkor most hated the Eldar, both because they were fair and joyful, and because in them he saw the reason for the arising of the Valar and his own downfall. Therefore, all the more did he feign love for them and seek their friendship, and he offered them the service of his lore and labor in any great deed that they would do. The Vanyar indeed held him in suspicion, for they dwelt in light of the trees and were content, and to the Teleri he gave small heed, thinking them of little worth, tools too weak for his design. But the Noldor took delight in the hidden knowledge that he could reveal to them, and some hearkened towards that it would have been better for them never to have heard. Melkor indeed declared afterwards that Feanor had learned much art from him in secret, and had been instructed by him in the greatest of all his works. But he lied in his lust and his envy, for none of the Eldalie ever hated Melkor more than Feanor, son of Finwë, who first named him Morgoth, and, and snared though he was in the webs of Melkor's malice against the Valar, he held no con converse with him and took no counsel from him. For Feanor was driven by the fire of his own heart only, working ever swiftly and alone, and he asked the aid and sought the counsel of none that dwelt in Amun, great or small, save only and for a little while of Nardanel the Wise, his wife. All right, so, <laughs> chapter six, done. But we still have it, six to go, or six to go, seven to go. My goodness, I keep fumbling over my words. But before we go to chapter seven, um, a little um, summary of this of the last part of six is that um, Melkor pretty much looks at all the elves and he hates how much that they've prospered and especially in the light of the trees because um, obviously that's what pretty much pours forth like goodness and health and growth and whatnot. It's pretty much healing the lands as well as, I mean, pretty much all the elves. And all the Valar are trying to pretty much uh, undo all of Melkor's um, marring still, most likely, even though it's like years and years, you know, since then. But he pretty much hates how much they have actually restored of all of his wrongs, wrongdoings. And uh, it also tells us that Feanor, even though he, um, even though he's a great craftsman and whatnot, and even though he took some advice from Melkor, he was never really... Um, under Melkor's actual uh, servitude, I guess. And I guess Melkor was fine with it, in a way. I don't know. It was kind of seemed interesting, so. Uh, but yeah, pretty much that. Feanor is <laughs> on, by himself all the time, making his own little crafts and whatnot, and that's how the pretty much chapter ends. So, that is chapter 6. So now we can go straight on over to chapter 7, called Of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor. In that time were made those things that afterwards were most renowned of all the works of the elves. For Feanor, being come to his full might, was filled with a new thought, or it may be that some shadow of foreknowledge came to him of the doom that drew near, and he pondered how the light of the trees, the glory of the blessed realm, might be preserved imperishable. Then he began a long and secret labor, and he summoned all his lore and his power and his subtle skill. And at the end of all, he made the Silmarils. And obviously, that is pretty much a huge deal of, you know, the whole story. So, yes, Feanor creates the Silmarils. So, if there's any first-time listeners or readers or whatnot, it is Feanor who creates the Silmarils. Just letting you know. <laughs> so, back to it here. As three great jewels they were in form, but not until the end when Feanor shall return who perished ere the sun was made and sits now in the halls of awaiting and comes no more among his kin. Not until the sun passes and the moon falls shall it be known of what substance they were made. Like the crystal of diamonds it appeared, and yet was more strong than adamant, so that no violence could mar it or break it within the kingdom of Arda. Yet that crystal was to the Silmarils, but as is the body to the children of Ilavatar, the house of its inner fire, that is within it and yet in all parts of it, and is its life. 
and the inner fire of the Silmarils, Fëanor made of the blended light of the trees of Valinor, which lives in them yet, though the trees have long withered and shine no more. Therefore, even in the darkness of the deepest treasury of the Silmarils, of their own radiance shone like the stars of Varda. And yet, as they were indeed living things, they rejoiced in light, and received it, and gave it, gave it back in hues more marvelous than before. All who dwelt in Amun were filled with wonder and delight at the work of Fëanor, and Varda ho hollowed, <laughs> well, yeah, hollowed, <laughs> hollowed the Silmarils, so that thereafter no mortal flesh, nor hands unclean, nor anything of evil, of evil will, might touch them, but it was scorched and withered. And Mandos foretold that the fates of Arda, earth, sea, and air lay locked within them. The heart of Fëanor was fast bound to these things that he himself had made. Yeah, pretty much um, the whole, like, next segment is like, hey, like, uh, <laughs> Fëanor's creation is, like, a really big deal that, like, the Valar, the elves, the children of Iluvatar are all, like, in huge awe of it, which makes sense because it's legit just, like, the light of the trees of Valinor are trapped, well, not trapped, I just, like, contained into three gems. So I thought that was actually really cool. And... Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it is. They're just all in awe of his creation. So, uh, back to it here. Then Melkor lusted for the Silmarils, and the very memory of their radiance was a gnawing fire in his heart. From that time forth, inflamed by his desire, he saw it ever more eagerly how he should destroy Fëanor and end the friendship of the Valar and the Elves. But he dissembled, yeah, dissembled his purposes with cunning, and nothing of his malice could yet be seen in the semblance that he wore. Long was he at work, and slow at first, and barren was his labor. But he that sows and lies in the end shall not lack of a harvest, and soon he may rest from toil indeed, while others reap and sow in his stead. Ever Melkor found some ears that would heed him, and some tongues that would en enlarge what they had heard, and his lies passed from friend to friend as secrets of which the knowledge proves the teller wise. Bitterly did the Noldor atone for the folly of their open years in the days that followed after. When he saw that many leaned towards him, Melkor would often walk among them, and amid his fair words others were woven, so subtly that many who heard them believed in recollection that they arose from their own thought. Visions he would conjure in their hearts of the mighty realms that they could have ruled at their own will, in power and freedom in the east, and then whispers went abroad that the Valar had brought the Eldar to Amun because of their jealousy, fearing that the beauty of the Quendi and the Maker's power that Iluvatar had bequeathed to them would grow too great for the Valar to govern, as the elves waxed and spread over the wide lands of the world. So, yeah, we pretty much get um, Melkor being um, more tricky and cunning, um, almost like, um, I don't know, kind of reminds me of Loki in a way, both in, like, film version, but also in the actual mythology version, just him being a very charismatic but also mischievous um, figure trying to aid people to his sides with his words and whatnot. And that's kind of pretty much what Melkor is doing is that he blends in with all the people that he wants on his side. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, like the Valor are just kind of, they're, they're, they're sneaky. They're the sneaky ones. I'm the one who's trying to like make sense here. So, and they, and it, it was really cool actually one of these sentences, uh, Oh, man, I forgot that, actually. Oh, yeah, they, they believe in recollection that they arose from their own thought. So he pretty much has so, so much manipulation that he can force an image into somebody else's head and be like, no, 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 you said that. So I don't, it's just very a very dangerous trait to have as a villain. So just kind of like thoughts of mine. <laughs> All right, uh, back to the story here. In those days, moreover, though the Valar knew indeed the coming of men that were to be, the elves as yet knew not of it, for Manwe had not revealed it to them. But Melkor spoke to them in secret of mortal men, seeing how the silence of the Valar might be twisted to evil. Little he knew yet concerning men, for engrossing with his own thought in the music, he had paid small heed to the third theme of Ilavatar. But now the whisper went among the elves that Manwe held them captive, so that men might come and supplant them in the kingdoms of Middle Earth. For the Valar, Valar, I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> For the Valar saw that they might more easily sway this short lived and weaker race, defrauding the elves of the inheritance of Iluvatar. 
Small truth was there in this, and little have the Valar ever prevailed to sway the wills of men. But many of the Noldor believed, or half-believed, the evil words. Thus ere the Valar were aware, the peace of Valinor was poisoned. The Noldor began to mur murmur against them, and many became filled with pride, forgetting how much of what they had and knew came to them in gift of the Valar. Fiercest burned the new flame of desire for freedom and wider realms in the eager heart of Fainor. And Melkor laughed in his secrecy, for to that mark his lies had been addressed. Oh yeah, addressed. <laughs> Hating Fainor above all and lusting ever for the Silmarils. But these he was not suffered to approach, for though at great feasts Fainor would wear them, blazing on his brow, at other times they were guarded close, locked in the deep chambers of his horde in Tyrion. For Feanor began to love the Silmarils with a greedy love, and grudged the, grudged the sight of them to all, save to his father and his seven sons. He seldom remembered now that the light within them was not his own. Um, yeah. So now we get to the point where uh, Mel both Melkor and Feanor are pretty much falling to like a lure of the Silmarils. They're pretty much lusting after them 24-7, and Feanor is like, nobody can have them, nobody can see them even after he pretty much wears them, like, like pridefully, but then he's like, nah, maybe I shouldn't do that, because they're mine. But he also forgets that, oh yeah, it's not even the light that is his. Like, he only, you know, uh, trapped it inside of these um, gems, pretty much. So, And then, of course, Melkor is there just being like, I want them! And that's pretty much it. So, <laughs> uh, back to it here. Also, apologies if my <laughs> voice is a little off, uh, a little, a little stuffy today. So hopefully the reading's all right. But anyway, so high, high princess, princess. I said princess instead of princes. <laughs> high princes were Feanor and Fingolfin, the elder sons of Finway, honored by all in Amon. But now they grew proud and jealous, each of his rights and his possessions. Then Melkor set new lies abroad the Eldamar. And whispers came to Feanor that Fingolfin and his sons were plotting to usurp the leadership of Finway and of the elder line of Feanor, and to supplant them by the leave of the Valar. For the Valar were ill-pleased that the Silmaros lay in Tyrion and were not committed to their keeping. But to Fingolfin and Fernarfin it was said, Beware, small love was has the proud son of Muriel ever had for the children of Indus. Now he has become great, and he has his father in his hand. It will not be long before he drives you forth from Tuna. And when Melkor saw that these lies were smoldering, and that pride and anger were awake among the Noldor, he spoke to them concerning weapons, and in that time the Noldor began the smithying of swords and axes and spears. Shields also they made, displaying the tokens of many houses and kindreds that vied one with, with another. And these only they wore abroad, and of other weapons they did not speak, for each believed that he alone had received the warning. And Feanor made a secret forge, of which not even Melkor was aware, and there he tempered fell swords for himself and for his swords, and made tall helms with plumes of red. Bitterly did Matan rue the day when he taught to the husband of Nerdanel all the lore and metalwork that he had learned of Aule. Thus with lies and evil whisperings and false counsel, Melkor kindled the hearts of the Noldor to strife, and of their quarrels came at length the end of the high days of Valinor and the evening of its ancient glory. For Feanor now began openly to speak words of rebellion against the Valar, crying aloud that he would depart from Valinor back to the world without, and would deliver the Noldor from thraldom if they would follow him. Yeah, so um, Feanor is uh, getting kind of paranoid in a way, but only because of Melkor's um, tricky lies and whatnot. Uh, he's such... <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Melkor is just... The, the way that he has with words... And even, like, it's it's pretty much a whole long, long game of telephone, really. I mean, he starts it, but apparently, like, they do a really good job <laughs> of it. That it, even Feanor is just like, you know what, maybe the Valor aren't really that great. And then he pretty much has his own secret forge and pretty much makes these, like, dark blades that he just, it's only for him and his sons. So, I mean, like, it's a cool thing. To actually have like enchanted swords in your own like smithing um, place, uh, it, it's a very cool idea and I like it. But like, it's it's also Fedor and he's growing dark, so not good 
for this instance, <laughs> basically. So, we'll just go right back into it. Then there was great unrest in Tyrion, and Finway was troubled, and he summoned all his lords to council. But Fingolfin hastened to his halls and stood before him, saying, King and father, wilt thou not restrain the pride of our father, bro father, <laughs> brother, Cora Finway, who is called the Spirit of Fire all too truly? By what right does he speak for all our people, as if he were king? Thou it was who long ago spoke before the Quendi, bidding them acceptance the summons of the Valar to Amun. Thou it was that led the Noldor upon the long road through the perils of Middle-earth to the light of Eldamar. If thou dost not now repent of it, two sons at least thou hast to honor thy words. But even as Fingolfin spoke, Feanor strode into the chamber, and he was fully armed, his high helm upon his head, and at his side a mighty sword. So it is, even as I had guessed, he said, my half-brother would be before me with my father, in this as in all other matters. Then turning upon Fingolfin, he drew his sword, crying, Get thee gone, and take thy due place. Fingolfin bowed before Finway, and without word or glance to Feanor, he went from the chamber. But Feanor followed him, and at the door of the king's house he stayed him, and at the point of his bright sword he sat against Fingolfin's breast. See, half-brother, he said, this is sharper than thy tongue. Try but once more to assert my place in the love of my father, and maybe it will rid the Noldor of one who seeks to be the master of thralls. These words were heard by many, for the house of Finway was in the great square beneath the Mindon. But again Fingolfin made no answer and passing through the throng in silence, he went to seek for Narfin, his brother. So pretty much there's a whole scene that unravels, which we don't actually get, you know, too much in, like, the beginning days of, like, you know, specific scenes, but it's pretty much Feanor turning against his own brothers, which is a big deal, <laughs> especially when it comes to Finway, because he's a really big deal. So, um, yeah, pretty much everybody sees Feanor just being really arrogant and... You know, like, like, you know, try it again and I'll pretty much kill you. So, uh, back to it here. Now, the unrest of the Noldor was not indeed, was not indeed hidden from the Valar, but its seed had been sown in the dark. And therefore, since Feanor first spoke openly against them, they judged that he was the mover of discontent, being eminent in self-will and arrogance, though all the Noldor had become proud. And Manwe was grieved, but he watched and said no word. The Valar had brought the Eldar to their land freely, to dwell or to depart. And though they might judge departure to be folly, they might not restrain them from it. But now the deeds of Feanor could not be passed over, and the Valar were angered and dismayed. And he was summoned to appear before them at the gates of Val Valmar, to answer for all his words and deeds. There also were summoned all others who had any part in this matter, or any knowledge of it. And Feanor, standing before Mandos in the Ring of Doom, was commanded to answer all that was asked of him. Then at last the root was laid bare, and the malice of Melkor revealed, and straightway Tulkas left the council to lay hands upon him and bring him again to ju judgment. But Feanor was not held guiltless, for he it was that had broken the peace of Valinor and drawn his sword upon his kinsmen. And Mandoth said to him, Thou speakest of Thraldom. If Thraldom it be, it be, thou canst not escape it, for Manwe is king of Arda and not of Amun only. And this deed was unlawful, whether in Amun or, or not in Amun. Therefore this doom is now made. For twelve years thou shalt leave Tyrion, where this threat was uttered. In that time take counsel with thyself, and remember who and what thou art. But after that time this matter shall be peace, set in peace, and held redressed, if others will release thee. Then Fingolfin said, I will release my brother. But Feanor spoke no word in answer, st standing silent before the Valar. Then he turned and left the council and departed from Val Valmar. With him into banishment went his seven sons, and northward in Valinor they made a strong place and treasury in the hills. And there at Formenos a multitude of gems were laid in hoard, and weapons also, and the Silmarils were shut in a chamber of iron. Thither also came Finway the king because of the love that he bore to Feanor, and Fingolfin ruled the Noldor in Tyrion. Thus the lies of Melkor were made true in seeming, though Feanor by his own deeds had brought this thing to pass, and their bitterness that Melkor had sown endured, and lived still long afterwards between the sons of Fingolfin and Feanor. All right. <laughs> it was a lot to read here, and I think we're almost done. Yeah, we're almost done here. Uh, yeah, pretty much uh, it speaks of, like, the... 
uh, I guess you could say like the strife between uh, Fingolfin and Feanor. Uh, Fingolfin's trying to be like the better guy, not even like the better brother, just like just being like like yes, Feanor definitely tried to pretty much <laughs> almost kill me in a way. I mean, he definitely threatened me, but like like uh, <laughs> whoever releases Feanor and immediately Fing Fingolfin's just like no, 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 yeah, I'll do it. Even even though he's you know he was the one being threatened, so he's pretty much being like the the, the bigger guy in in a, in a sense. And because Finway loves Feanor so much that in banishment he follows him, and Fingolfin pretty much takes his place. So kind of a long story short there, but um, I don't know, just like another reason why I personally really love Fingolfin as character is that even though he was threatened by Feanor. His brother, well, like his half brother, but even still, I mean, still fam, still family, still fam. <laughs> How the words and vocabulary have changed over the times. My goodness. But anyway, we're not here for that. Um, pretty much, they're still family. There's, they're still brothers. And even after that, he was like, no, nah, when his servitude and whatnot is, or his banishment's done, then yes, I will release him, and then all will be fine. Now we can go right back to the story again. Now Melkor, knowing that his devices had been revealed, hid himself and passed from place to place as a cloud in the hills. And Tulka sought for him in vain. Then it seemed to the people of Val Valinor that the light of the trees was dimmed, and the shadows of all standing things grew longer and darker in that time. It is told that for a time, Melkor was not seen again in Valinor, nor was any rumor heard of him until suddenly he came to Formenos and spoke with Feanor before his doors. Friendship he feigned with cunning argument, urging him to his former thought of flight from the trammels of the Valar. And he said, Behold the truth of all that I have spoken, and how thou art banished unjustly. But if the heart of Feanor is yet free and bold, as were his words in Tyrion, then I will aid him and bring him far from his narrow land. For am I not Valar also? Yea, and more than those who sit in pride in Valimar, and I have been ever been a friend to the Noldor, the most skilled and most valiant of the people of Arda. Now, Feanor's heart was still bitter at his humiliation before Mandos, and he looked at Melkor in silence, pondering if indeed he might yet trust him so far as to aid him in his flight. And Melkor, seeing that Feanor wavered, and knowing that the Silmarils held his heart in thrall, and said at last, Here is a strong place, and well guarded. But think not that the Silmarils will lie safe in any treasury within the realm of the Valar. But his cunning overreached his aim. His words touched too deep and awoke a fire more fierce than he designed. And Feanor looked upon Melkor with eyes that burned through his fair semblance and pierced the cloaks of his mind, perceiving there his fierce lust for the Silmarils. Then hate overcame Feanor's fear, and he cursed Melkor and bade him be gone, saying, Get thee gone from my gate. Thou, thou jail crow of Mandos. And he shut the doors of his house in the face of the mightiest of all the dwellers in Ea. So, I just... <laughs> I just really... <laughs> I just really love Feanor in this moment, too. Like, yes, he's, he's definitely being, like, practically like Thorin in The Hobbit of just um, coveting the Silmarils for himself. And he's just like, no, 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 this is mine. And as soon as Melkor's like, look, listen, the Silmarils aren't going to be safe here. And he just slams the door in his face. He's like, get out of here. <laughs> just, I don't know. I just picture it really funny. Just it's pretty much just slamming the, slamming the doors in his face. And it's like, mm, wow, that's, that's a interesting move. <laughs> and, uh, I'll read the rest of this chapter here, actually. Uh, then Melkor departed in shame for he was himself in peril and he saw not his time yet for revenge, but his heart was black with anger. And Finway was filled with great fear, and in haste he sent messengers to Manwe in Valmar. Now the Valar were sitting in council before their gates, fearing the lengthening of the shadows, when the messengers came from Formenos. At once Orome and Tolkas sprang up, but even as they set out in pursuit, messengers came from Eldamar, telling that Melkor had fled through the Calakiria, and from the hill of Tuna the elves had seen him pass in wrath as a thundercloud. And they said that, Thence he had turned northward, for the Telerian Alequande had seen his shadow going by their haven towards Aramon. Thus Melkor departed from Valinor, and for a while the two trees shone again unshadowed, and the land was filled with light. 
But the valor sought in vain for tidings of their enemies, enemy, sorry, <laughs> enemy, and as a cloud far off that looms ever higher, borne upon a slow cold wind, a doubt now marred the joy of all the dwellers in Amun, dreading they knew not what evil that yet might come. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty much, um, Melkor kind of like leaves Fenor's place. Fenor is kind of uh, worried because Fenor practically just slammed the, his door in like straight up against uh, Melkor, and that's not the greatest move ever because they're like, it's it's Melkor. You, you don't do that, but uh, Fenor was like, no, nope, he pissed me off, so that's what I did. <laughs> And then pretty much uh, at the end of it is like the Valor were like, well, we know that he's out there and we know that he's plotting, but all these different elves are saying that they see him as a different form all across Val Valinor. And eventually my is like, you know what? Since they've seen me in all these places, I got to leave, but not quite. So that, that'll that actually be for the next couple chapters. So hopefully I'll... Um, Hopefully I'll have time to record and upload on time, but we'll see because there's a lot happening all at once. So, um, yeah, so that was chapter six and seven of the Silmar Silmarillion. Um, I'm not, I don't think I'm always going to do two chapters at once just because it is a lot, but it kind of depends on how long the chapters are. If they're only a couple pages long, then I'll do both pretty much what I did for this one. And I'm pretty sure I might do it for the next one, but we'll see. So, yeah, um, if you guys um, enjoy uh, my reading of the Silmarillion so far and all of my comments, um, that'd be great. Uh, just let me know. Uh, keep listening uh, for the few of you who, who actually have listened. So that's actually kind of incredible that I actually have like a few listens. It's mostly more for like a project of mine, personal project. And I don't know, just kind of see where it goes off. And I don't know, I'm just kind of a nerdy guy in search of deep delving into all of Tolkien's works. So I'm, I'm still pretty excited about it. So yeah, stay tuned for the next episode. And may the light of Elbereth be with you all. Farewell.